Welcome to worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. It is my joy to be with this congregation as its minister and with people of all ages, of all stages of life. In this congregation, we are a people who are fully a human in all the ways that that means in our wonderfulness and in our struggles. We strive to put love at the center of our gathered community, of all of our efforts and our aspirations. So we are an intentional body gathered around our shared promise to support each other's spiritual journeys. So let us worship together all gender identities, sexual orientations, abilities, racial and ethnic identities, and politics. And may we root ourselves in the values of this faith, compassion and courage, transcendence, justice, transformation, and service. And as part of our understanding of our connections, we honor our relations past and present, for this is the ancestral home of the Peoria people. They were here and other nations along with them long before the first European settlers came down the Illinois River. So as we gather in worship, we always take a moment to honor the Peoria people for who they were and for who they are today. I want to welcome you if you are a guest or a recent visitor to our congregation. Thank you for joining us in person or online. Uh, we have plenty of name tags. Please help us get to know you. And also, you are welcome to come and join us after the service for fellowship and coffee hour if you're with us in person. And also stay on the Zoom room for a chat as well. And I want to invite us into being ready for this hour. Please turn your respective devices to either vibrate or silent worship mode, as we tend to call it. Never bad to check. All right, let me offer a couple of notes about uh, our, what's going on in the congregation today and to, into next weekend. Today, after service, is our annual salad lunch. And this is where, I love this description because it's come to me from all this time, where people 
will bring, it's a potluck of salads of all kinds. We have bread and some dessert and so on and so forth. And then you come and bring a salad and then you come and pay to eat the salad. But let me tell you why. It's for a very good cause, which is we receive donations uh, as part of the salad lunch that go directly into the ministerial discretionary fund. So this fund is something that I have access to and in consultation with our caring team, um, it's a way that folks who are in a dire need of any particular kind can have a little bit of financial help. Uh, and I know we all have had our moments when paying a bill or a little bit of a boost can make an enormous difference in our lives. And this is what this fund is for. Uh, so come and join us after the service. I always am fascinated to see what people think of as salad. It might be pizza for all I know, which is also good. But come and join us for our lunch after. Also, uh, we have two very special notes about next weekend. Is um, Next Sunday is our annual flower communion. This is a traditional Unitarian Universalist practice. Uh, folks bring flowers bring them to a common bouquet, and that's part of how we represent the diversity and the range among us, but also how we gather as well. Uh, and it's our the 100th anniversary of the existence of this flower communion, so I want to come and invite us folks to, to join us for next weekend. And also very special in our annual calendar is the congregational meeting, because yes, uh, and that's a chance for us to vote on the budget and also vote on the slate of leaders for the coming year. In uh, two weeks, uh, I want to offer also one more note. We actually won't be in the building in two weeks on June 11th. Uh, we will be at the Herm Farm across the river and through the woods um, to have our annual picnic. And the picnic is a brunch, too. It starts about 9.30 for the food, and then we have our service at about 10.45. So I want to invite folks to that. You can learn more uh, from our ushers and our greeters and also from our publications as well. All right, there we go. I wanted to make sure people were in the loop. And now I want to invite Nancy Rakoff forward for an update on our annual campaign. Thank you, Reverend Jennifer. Can you believe that you're participating in a church that is 180 years old? Our church was founded before the Civil War in 1843. And it's been a voice of liberal religion throughout that war, two world wars, a depression, conflict over the Vietnam War, and yes, a pandemic. Thousands of people over those 180 years have been members of this church working to accomplish its vision and supporting it through thick and thin. It is possible for us to be here today because of all those people in the past. And it is our vision to continue to be a welcoming place, respecting people's individual freedom of belief for the next 180 years. Speaking of thick and thin, well, you can guess, the pandemic was one of those thin times in many churches, including ours. But we are coming back strong. We accomplish our vision each year because the members and friends of this church make a financial commitment, a pledge, and then they get involved in the church's efforts and activities and worship and work. Pledges provide about 80% of the support of our work. This year, our budget team and our board cut the budget very significantly before the annual campaign even started. It's a pretty bare bones, a very bare bones budget. They recognize that like other churches, we have fewer members than before the pandemic. All of you here who are members or supporting friends are probably among the 172 families and individuals who have already made your pledge. And our pledges so far total $331,665. That's 95% of the pledges needed. 21 families have either pledged for the first time or have reinstated a pledge they skipped during the pandemic, and that is truly wonderful. But this year, as some other years, 
Some people have had significant financial changes in their lives, and they can't pledge as much as they did before. And others are stepping forward and taking their turn at increasing their pledges. Next Sunday, June 4th, is our congregational meeting, as you've already heard, and we'll vote on our budget. And we still have about $28,000 to raise to meet our pledge goal, which as I said, is bare bones toward our bare bones budget. It supports our worship, lifespan religious education, fellowship, social justice work, and helping others near and far. And it supports the staff who make sure that it all happens. If you haven't yet pledged or have thought more about your pledge, please stop at the table in the foyer and make your investment in the next 180 years. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. And I want to offer that part of what we're able to do, um, we have certainly kind of slimmed down the budget significantly, but we're also in a place where it's, we can still do great things going into next year. So it's been a really good process of finding that balance. I have to say, given what we're planning and what we're looking forward to, I'm excited about what we can accomplish together. Um, so if we can make it that last little bit to make the budget, wow, we are going to do great things. So thank you. And now part of how we welcome each other um, is that we offer a moment of greeting our neighbors during the service. So I invite you to say hello in the sanctuary or online. And as we are a community of consent, please ask before a hug or a handshake. And I will call you back with our first hymn, Come and Go With Me. And now please greet your neighbor. Our first hymn is number 1018, Come and Go With Me. Would you please rise in body or spirit? Yes, there's a typo in the order of service. We do know. Look at the screen. It is correct. Thank you. Oh.
Let me invite Mary Mahalan Kafar forward for our opening words. Mary. Good morning, everyone. The opening words, Creation is Messy by Reverend Laura Mendes. Creation is messy, inconvenient, and often uncooperative. Take a look at the cosmos. Go ahead, close your eyes, and imagine the stars. When you do, forget Franz Joseph Hayden's spacious, vermin bit. His images are far too tidy. See the real mess the universe has made of itself 14 billion years ago. All of creation is still trying to clean that up. It's called the Big Band, not the Grand Coalences. For a reason, mistakes were made, probably, and incorporated into the whole anyway. And wonders never cease. Here we are, still muddling along, 14 billion years after the fact. Now open your eyes and look around. You are surrounded by the most astounding, miraculous wonders of all. Each other, community, life ongoing, and caring about life ongoing. So it is, so it shall be, because we care. Namaste. All right, thank you. And let me invite the McAlexander family forward to light our chalice. Good morning. We are Unitarian Universalists. This is the Church of the Open Mind. This is the Church of the Loving Heart. This is the Church of the Helping Hands. This is our church. <laughs> I, I like to pull in here this one. <laughs> As part of declaring our church, as part of celebrating and um, serving in all the ways that we do of being an open mind, an open heart, and the helping hands, we take up a collection during our service. And this is how we recognize the act of giving as itself can be intentional. Um, even if, as many of us do, we have kind of regular deposits from, uh, from our banking accounts into the church uh, office, and which is also wonderful. But the act of taking the collection during the service is one where we can celebrate in a tangible way the intentionality of gathering and the meaning of giving. Um, and part of what we also do with our act of giving is that we give it away into the world. We share our abundance with our Share the Plate program. Um, about half of the undesignated fund in the service uh, that we gather on every Sunday goes to a named recipient. In this case, for this month, it's the East Bluff Community Center Food Pantry, um, also known as EBC. And the food pantry is a place where people can choose from a variety of food items, um, get a prepared bag, choose a meat and a dessert. And it really serves folks who are unhoused or in low, low income. Um, and it's available to folks twice a month, which, as you might imagine, for folks who have very limited means, knowing that you have a stable, reliable source of food really can make a world of difference in everybody's lives. Um, this is also a group that is staffed entirely by volunteers. It is a 501c3. It doesn't receive government funding. So the funds that communities like our congregation offer 
really makes it possible for them to exist and to serve. So as part of our share of the plate, again, half the undesignated offering goes to EBC and half to the running of the congregation. Uh, please indicate uh, if it, and if you're using an envelope or a check, please indicate if it's towards your pledge or towards the food pantry um, for a share of the plate. The ushers will pass the plates during our music for meditation. And after the plates have passed, you're welcome to come and light candles of care. Thank you for all the ways that you give to sustain the ministry of this congregation, whether it's inside the walls or out in the world. And now I invite the ushers to please come forward. From our separate joys and struggles, we come here to find a place of balance, to find the blessing of restlessness. All are welcome to follow, to lead, to teach, to learn. 
all are welcome to join the dance, to catch our breath. All are welcome to give generously, receive gratefully. All are welcome. If we are steady and composed, if we feel completely lost, if we don't actually know what we're feeling. This community has a place for us here. We matter and we are loved. And in that spirit, this is the time for the sharing of the joys and sorrows of the congregation. We want to begin with uh, a note of uh, joy within from our larger community that the Illinois State Legislature passed school lunches for grades K through 12. Yes, people are fed. Speaking of feeding the people, yes. We offer uh, notes of wishes for complete uh, and speedy return to good health to Sherry and Gary Campbell who are both home recovering from COVID, and also to Lucy McRae. Uh, she says she is fine, because I'm sure she always says she's going to be fine. Um, after spending a few hours in the emergency room after a fall this weekend, but she's being well cared for. We offer a couple of notes of sorrow and sympathy we extend our care and sympathy to Lloyd Hedges and the family and friends who mourn the loss of Bonnie Hedges. Bonnie died on May 23rd. And her memorial will be here at the church at 11 a.m. on June 12th. We extend our sympathy to Mark Bircher, who mourns uh, the passing of his mother, Myrna Bircher, age 93, um, on May 16th. We also offer a couple of other notes in our larger community. Um, so we have just been passing the first anniversary of the uh, terrible school massacre in Uvalde, Texas. And we are also remembering the anniversary of George Floyd's murder by the police. We hold so much in our hearts in this moment. As we are gathered, this is Memorial Day. I want to offer a prayer from my colleague, the Reverend Wayne Arneson. Spirit of life. We enter into the season of Memorial Day surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses. We remember, first of all, the people who are currently serving in the armed forces. We pray for their safe return. We also acknowledge that there are many who will not return. And as we grieve their passing, we pause to honor their service and their sacrifice. We also pause in this hour to give thanks for all who have served in the nation's armed services. Those who have not cannot fully imagine the experience of war, but we do know war's aftermath and the toll that it can take on the human heart. This day remembers and acknowledges loss, and so do we remember those whom we have loved and lost. We hold their names and their faces in our mind's eye. We recall the gifts they gave to us through the strength of their being, the depth of their love, the courage of their dying, and the fullness of their living. In the holy quiet of this hour, their names surround us and they live with us in blessed memory. May we remain together in silence for a moment as a tribute to all that they have meant to us. Please join me in a moment of quiet shared together.
Amen, and blessed be. I'd like to invite Heather McMeekin forward to offer our story for today. Good morning. Our Place in the Cosmos by Reverend Erica Hewitt. We humans have always looked up at the stars, wondered about them, and even told stories about them during the many thousands of years that human beings have been looking up at the stars. We've changed our understanding of what the universe looks like and how it works. More than 500 years ago, a man named Nicholas Copernicus was born in Poland. He watched the stars and planets and used his observations to come up with a pretty unique and upsetting idea. In his day, most people thought that the Earth was at the center of the universe. They also thought that the stars were little holes in a glass ball around the Earth. Copernicus thought, what if the universe doesn't move around the Earth? What if the Earth is actually a planet circling the sun? He wrote a book about this idea, which wasn't popular. If he hadn't died soon after, it's possible he would have been put in jail. Today, we know that Copernicus was right. Our planet Earth circles the sun, which is a star. It took a long, long time, hundreds of years, for people to finally believe this and to stop saying that the Earth was at the center of the universe. But for hundreds of years, the belief that the universe revolved around the Earth was so stuck in people's minds that it became part of religion too. It was kind of a religious belief. So when Copernicus said, I don't think the heavens revolve around the Earth, he was speaking as a scientist, but the church heard it as challenging their religion. There's a word for that, heresy. That meant that not just scientists, but anyone could get in big trouble for promoting the idea that the sun was at the center of our solar system. Believe it or not, this upsetting theory of Copernicus intersects with our story of our Unitarian ancestors. Not very far away from where Copernicus watched the planets and stars, there's a land called Transylvania, a land of rolling green hills and mountains. Transylvania is where some of the first Unitarians built their churches and formed our faith right around the same time that Copernicus wrote his book about the earth revolving around the sun. Our Unitarian ancestors already knew that that what it was like to say and believe things that could get them into trouble. One of those was Edge Oz Istin, or God is One. When they and we say God is one, we're saying that we don't agree with the Christian doctrine that Jesus was God incarnate. We're saying he was fully human. A lot of Unitarians in Transylvania and elsewhere died because they wouldn't stop believing or saying that. One of the villages in Transylvania today, a part of Romania that's ethnically Hungarian, is Oakland. Its Unitarian church is over 400 years old. Like a lot of Transylvanian Unitarian churches, the church has a wooden ceiling that's divided into deep square panels. Most of them have flowers or plants painted on them but there's one very special ceiling panel, a sun surrounded by circling planets. It's a diagram of the Copernican solar system. In Blessing the World, Rebecca Parker writes, holy regard for knowledge is at the heart of our religious faith. At a time when religion was opposing science, 
Our ancestors in the remote mountains and valleys of Transylvania built sanctuaries that affirmed the discoveries of science. They did so even when the dominant religious culture advanced ideologies that allowed no new revelation. Let us celebrate these gifts which have been woven into our religious DNA. We belong to a tradition in which religion and science have never been forced apart or asked each other to be silent. We, as a people, encourage one another to explore and discover, to ask questions and declare that revelation is not sealed and will never be sealed, and to freely follow the call, whatever its source, that connects us most deeply to the world inside of us and to the universe around us. And now let us sing our children and youth to class with their adults. Let's sing. Part of what we're engaged with in this moment is some pretty large-scale thinking, you know, talking about the cosmos in one way, shape, or form. But I want to offer in this moment that one of the foundational theologies of our 20th century um, has its origin in kitchen table conversations between a mother and a son. One of the most radical and powerful tools we have for creating and transforming the world is what emerges when we meet with and listen to one another and then figure out what new incarnation, what new living and being we might gain from that effort. So this story I want to offer is part of that origin story. So there's a gentleman, uh, Henry Nelson Wyman, was born in 1884 in Rock Hill, Missouri. He was, came into a large family and parents who were active in a Presbyterian tradition. They had both taught and gone to seminary uh, in the course of things. The, his father went into ministry. His mother was a teacher. And Henry operated as an adult in much of the thinking of the 20th century. And he was someone who didn't set out to be a minister, but it was irresistible as he found along the way. He would engage in exploration with his mother. And he says, when I was a boy, we had long intimate talks in which each tried to express to the other what most deeply felt and thought. We did not talk about religion particularly, but about anything which at the time seemed to be of chief concern. He said, I would come from those talks with a feeling of exultation, of release and aspiration, as though there was something great to live for. This comes from Wyman and how he was talking about how I got my religion. From a very early age, grounded in his parents' life in ministry and religious inquiry, Henry was inclined toward this ecstatic experience of exploration. He would come out of these conversations with kind of this glow and a high and wanting to do more. But this exploration was one that was not the kind that would remove him from being engaged with the world, although it certainly could have been so. You know, some theologies and some thinking can be so transcendent, they actually have little to do, a little connection with daily life. But here is Henry Nelson Wyman, and he is engaged in study and coming from his place of, uh, 
uh, Presbyterianism plus, plus from Christianity, he continued to read and explore. There were times when he would actually read so much he would neglect uh, his work, in fact. But he encountered in his reading a book by John Fisk called The Destiny of Man and, and engaged with Charles Darwin's theory of evolution and said, Darwin's theory and Christianity are entirely compatible and I'm going to figure it out. A little ambitious too. But, but what he operated from, his essential question throughout his life, and he evolved in the course of his life from Presbyterian to Congregational to Unitarian. Um, in fact, at one point later in his life, he served our Unitarian Versalist Congregation down in Carbondale. In fact, he served uh, as faculty up in Chicago also as well. So kind of in the neighborhood, if you will. But Henry Nelson Wyman's essential question continued through his entire life, and it was this. What operates in human life with such character and power that it will transform a man even as he cannot transform himself, saving a person from evil and leading that person to the best that human life can ever reach? What operates in human life with such character and power that it will transform a person as they cannot transform themselves, saving them from evil and leading them into the best life that human life that we can ever reach? And I want to say that part of where we enter into this question, because I think this is in many ways our essential question as well. How can we, what is transforming in our lives? Part of it that is in our capable, well, sometimes not so capable, but, but in our human hands, in our human abilities, but also what is larger than us and calling us on. And I want to offer that part of where we've come into this conversation um, about Wyman's theology, we've already been doing some of this work in previous conversations. In past services, I've talked about Adrian Rene Brown, who talked about emergence strategy. How do we create justice by working together? Um, Sonia Rene Taylor, who talks about how the body is not an apology, how we have a right and a presence to take up space, and that taking up space is itself a radical, essential act as a human person. And the late Bell Hooks, who calls us on to creativity, to keep acting out of love and service for each other. Just these three, for example, are black women calling us, contemporary black voices, calling us into community, into organization, into creating a new way. Now, Wyman, in his work at the early 20th century, this is part of our theological frame for being open to and finding new truth in folks such as Brown and Taylor and Hooks. So this is why we're working on this one today. Now, Wyman, uh, his school of thought was part of what's known as process theology. And I've mentioned this before, characterized essentially as humans being co-creators with the larger forces of life. My colleague Suzel Lynch describes process theology this way. This has got, get, get, you, get, you got to get your big words head on for this one, so just hang in there. And she says, process theology evolved in the 1920s from the process philosophy of British mathematician Alfred North Whitehead who sought to shape a philosophy that would respond to the discoveries of post-Newtonian physics, such as the solar system we're working with with Copernicus, right? Which shifted the perspective of science on the nature of matter. Process theology, she says, posits a God that is not different from all other reality, a God that is not an unmoved mover, not static and unchanging, it's a God that functions as the lure, which draws in all things, all persons, all realities, toward ultimate fulfillment and unfolding. 
Another way to say this, she says, is that God is that which sustains the processes by which the world is continuously being created. She said, you don't have to use the word God either, but we have this continuous creation process. For Wyman, God occurred in relationships, is the intersection of beings and events. God, Wyman said, is the integrating process at work in the universe. God is the growth from which springs anew, new forms when the old perish. In short, in short, this understanding of process theology is, is a verb, is a continual emergence, always in motion, not as one fixed form or noun or image of what one might think is God, because one image is never, it's never going to be sufficient. It's, not all, it's also not beyond our larger experience of life either. We're not talking a supernatural experience. It's about the scope of our web of life that we are a part of. So in this understanding of creation, we have Wyman's core concept, which was the creative interchange. For him, creativity was this essential ethos. It was certainly in the cosmic sense, the largest sense we have, but also more specifically in addressing the major questions of our human life. Um, and the essence of this creative interchange, highly distilled, um, because boy, he wrote a lot of words, highly distilled. Here's what it looks like. Sharing oneself authentically, listening and integrating, discovering what may emerge, and then bringing that emergence into the community. Sounds kind of familiar, right? Sharing authentically, listening and integrating, discovering what might emerge, and then bringing that back into practice, into life. And he applied this thought into the Christian, early Christian church. This is where I get to be just a tiny bit geeky. So if I haven't already been, this is where I get more geeky. Just go with me here. Because I think one of the great mysteries as Unitarian Universalist is figuring out kind of sometimes what to do with Easter. Um, because we don't necessarily go for the, the Christ is risen kind of theology. But here's a different way to think about this. Wyman talked about the formative events of Christianity in the light of creative process. The thought and feeling of the least and lowly list, lowly, lowliest uh, was at the core of early Christian church, right? The least that were not welcomed into society. And it acted upon this group of early Christians um, as it was as important, that commitment of the least of these was as important as the thought and feeling of Jesus, his own teachings and his own presence. Christianity, Wyman says, was not something Jesus invented and then gave to others. It was rather something arising out of their midst in creative power. This was a concept that rose from this exchange in this group of people following the teachings of Jesus. And Jesus was really just the catalyst for this. Jesus' death released the creative power, allowing it to spread beyond the small community and the local practice. The disciples realized that the life-transforming creativity previously only known in direct relationship with Jesus, began to work and be far greater than any one teacher. And because what had been created and initiated by Jesus as a teacher, it seemed to his followers that he was actually present and with them. There was a presence there, not him, but a presence and part of that continual imagination. It was not a man named Jesus who arose from the dead, said Wyman. It was creative power. I can preach on creative power at Easter any time. Thank goodness. We can work with that. Jesus' disciples discovered their possibility and that that of their teachings, the potential, and took up that call to bring it to life beyond their teacher and beyond their own selves. 
these teachings of love and compassion and service and justice in society, they were able to take up those teachings and pass them down to the extent that we are still operating from them today. That is some powerful creativity. Now, another example of what we're engaged with here is the story about we heard from uh, about our place in the cosmos. This of Copernicus and others moving forward our human understanding of the world and of the universe, um, despite what had been fixed in place by others. You had folks such as Galileo and others, later explorers, reinforcing this heliocentric understanding of our solar system, of the universe, in fact. And all the great conflicts um, and, and heresies and so on that were at war in Europe as a result. We also had, it wasn't just these great battles, it was also showing up in these quiet corners in Transylvania. This sun-centered understanding of the solar system that found its way into the wood paneling that people would just gaze upon uh, during the service or any time being in the sanctuary in the Unitarian Church. In Blessing the World, Rebecca Parker writes, holy regard for knowledge is at the heart of our religious faith. At a time when religion was opposing science, our ancestors in these remote mountains built sanctuaries and affirmed the discoveries of science. And they did so even when the dominant religious culture said no to new revelation. This is creative exchange. This is creative work, as Wyman is reminding us and calling us towards. The creative process continues with us. It continues all the way down in our living tradition. Our questions in this moment may or may not necessarily be about the cosmos, but they're certainly large in front of us. We have had in this time, in this year, the question of how to be together, a smaller frame perhaps of how to be transforming ourselves um, and to leading our best human life. But we found answers to that along the way as, we've been ga- as we gather in congregational life, which operates in a particular place in our society, multi-generational relationships celebrating all the seasons of life and death that provides us with opportunities to wonder and question about the meaning of it all. And of course, in those questions, find that we are often lost and often don't know that the answers are final and done because goodness knows our struggles and our grief and our sorrows in the world are never done. But what we offer with one another in the very modest of places are moments such as remembering uh, remembering Larry Miller and Jason Fought, as we the, some of us did in the memory garden on Thursday evening, and celebrated these lives and served as family for these people, along with some of their friends, and blessed, blessed who they were, even as their physical form has gone away and we are simply left with memory and photo. And then as we gather for, say, a cookie or something after such a moment, remember with each other how precious it is to be together, how much comes from all that has been created as part of this community that allows us to be serve as family for people such as this, and then how we might serve one another going forward. 
we have been rejoicing in the return of something as simple and deep as congregational life. And also we have been a place where people can keep finding and seeking and wondering and encountering a place such as this for themselves and their children. It is good to see so many different faces in the congregation in so many ways. We have been engaged fully with the modest practice of gathering on Sundays, if nothing else, in the, our human questions of life and death and everything in between. We have engaged with the wondering of how to be good stewards of this planet. We have engaged in wondering how to cherish simply the human existence in all its diversity. Adrian Mary Brown and Sonia Renee Taylor and the late Bell Hooks, they have been part of the conversation that comes into our contemporary concerns about inherent worth and dignity in all forms, including drag, including transgender, including simply being black. So as we look into the coming year, we are on the edge of transitioning from finishing this year and into the coming year. We get to anticipate what comes next. We've survived and more than survived, so what now? What is the dream that is big enough, the creative impulse that is grand enough, that is worth the question? How can we lead ourselves and be transformed as people and as a congregation and as a faith into the best of human life that we can reach? To take up Wyman's question yet again. And as we conclude this year, enter into summer, I invite us to keep into that, keep learning, in, leaning into that question. What comes next? What shall be our answer? And I look forward to hearing more as we go along the way and when we return in the fall. It is good to be together. Let us go forth and keep finding our answer. Amen. Now please rise in body or spirit for our closing hymn number 12, O Life That Makes Maketh All Things New. We will listen once and then sing together.
We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry on our hearts until we are together again. We offer a closing from the Reverend Michael Schuler. We have reached the end of this time for the gathering of memory and for letting the imagination play with future possibilities. We have enjoyed magic moments and edified each other. Shall it be concluded then? Or will this adventure now commence to continue? Our separate paths converging, meeting, merging in the unending quest for love more perfect, the joyous struggle for meeting more sufficient and life more abundant. Is this ending to be an ending or is it merely a prelude to a new, more glorious beginning? I pose the question in our hearts lives the answer. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin. <laughs>